So we're gonna start with a long-term <clears throat> and a focus on scaling up. So why this focus and why now? So within the Mental Health Promotion Innovation Fund, scaling up promising approaches to child and youth mental health promotion is an explicit long-term goal and built into the phased funding model. So this session is intended to provide some valuable insights to help prepare for the next phases of the MHPIF and for anyone seeking to sustain and scale promising approaches for CYMHP. So it's relevant to, uh, to all attending the um, symposium, starting with that long-term vision and thinking about shorter term actions. So envisioning a destination, <laughs> just like Hawaii in the background there, Susan, uh, know where you are, consider how to get from here to there. So to do this, there are three components to this session. There's the, or to this triad. There's the 3A, which was the pre-recorded presentation, um, which I thought was fantastic, by uh, Mark Kabaj, and we've got him as part of the session um, today as well. 3B is the lived experiences of scaling up from a panel of four, another panel of four. That'll take us 50 minutes, and then we move into the small group discussions for another 25 to 30 minutes. Today on this part, we will close in the small groups and that will lead into a 30 minute break before the final session. So Eric, I'm gonna ask you to, um, um, to just speak to a point about an option for a breakout room. For sure. So once we once we break out into breakout rooms, similar to what we did yesterday, if there is anybody who would like to participate in the discussion in French, uh, please let uh, let us know in chat in Zoom chat, and I'll make sure that you get assigned to the appropriate room. Donc pour ceux qui veulent participer à la discussion en français, uh, veuillez indiquer dans le chat uh, sur Zoom uh, si si vous aimeriez le faire, et je vais uh, vérifier que vous 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 rendre vous vous rendez à la à la bonne uh, réunion. Si vous pouvez indiquer le en, dans le chat. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. Um, so, your feedback from yesterday um, did note that panel perspectives um, was something that you really appreciated. Um, and not that we were going to completely overhaul the, uh, or might not be able to completely overhaul the agenda for today, but thankfully, we, we have another lineup of exceptional panelists and we've reserved as much time as possible for them. So I'm going to be very brief on introductions. Uh, their bios are in Hoover and I invite you to refer to those. So whoo, that was a late breaking entry, Mark. So Mark Kabaj. He's providing our bookends for this session, the pre-recorded presentation to set the stage, which hopefully you've all had a chance to look at that um, terrific presentation. He'll follow the other panelists with a few reflections and ideas that we can take into the small group discussions as we wish. So what a great fit Mark is for these roles. He's actually lived social innovation and scaling long before started, before their recent prominence. So really bring some, some rich expertise and experience, um, navigation of those, uh, those fields and intersections. And the name of his consulting company says it all. The name of it is From Here to There. So we have four panelists who bring lived experiences of scaling up. They've been invited to share um, in up to 10 minutes each, and this is no small task. Uh, again, it, it really is just to frame the discussion. What they've been invited to speak to are three main points. What is the it that was sustained and scaled? What were some main lessons about the scaling process? And what are some remaining thorny issues and questions that you know, they think need to be explored further that could help advance our understanding? So big spoiler alert or warning for you. You're gonna hear lots of passion um, in these presentations. Uh, I mean, just based on my um, interactions with, with each, of these, each of these people, lots of wisdom um, and they will actually locate themselves in the most helpful ways. So I'm not going to duplicate that. The order of presentations will be uh, Claire, Cook, Claire Crooks from Western University 
Catherine Sharp from Community Food Centers Canada. Mary, see, I'm, I'm smiling already because I'm just, you know, I'm, re I'm remembering my conversations with this group. Mariette Chartier from the University of Manitoba, then a duel uh, with Carla Tate and Taylor uh, Ben Sacosa from the First Nations Health Authority in British Columbia. So as you listen to the presentations, please pose any questions in chat for response, either during or after the session. And uh, don't forget to wiggle for wellness between each presentation. Those will be the, the 10 minute marks. So um, I will now invite Claire to um, share her lived experience with us. Thank you so much, Barb. Uh, I really appreciate the opportunity from, from you and your team. I'm actually, um, I, I changed to the enhancing filter that you mentioned in the pre thing and I, I'm stunned by how much younger and smoother I look already so that's that's a win, but thank you for the opportunity to. Um, to talk to everyone today, thank you Mark for your excellent comments and and your. Um, your keynote if you Annetta if you want to pull up the slides that would be great. Um, so I'm, I'm a professor at Western University and I direct the Center for School Mental Health. So that means I typically work and live uh, on territory where the Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabe and Lanai Lenape all come together. And prior to that was the, the Attawandran um, traditional hunting grounds. So uh, really important meeting place, a place of, of relationship among nations and to the land. Uh, and really uh, something that I'm, I'm grateful for, um, the, the stewardship of the land by all the uh, initial peoples there. Um, so in the next 10 minutes, I'm going to talk about the it, what is the fourth R, a few lessons learned, and um, some and some thorny issues, as Barb said. Are my slides up? Not yet. No, Sorry, okay. they're coming. Anyway. Just a second. That's okay. Sorry, so, I'm, I'm on it. That's all right. So, um, the first, so the fourth R is is a relationship based social emotional learning program, uh, and the the R stands for relationships, and uh, it was meant to evoke or convey this idea that relationships education in school is just as important as the first three R's, reading, writing, and arithmetic. And I can tell you our very first scale up lesson is that that was a silly name to choose, partly because. Um, it doesn't translate well to French and partly because nobody under the age of 50 actually knows what the first three R's were. So that's that's a freebie lesson before I get to the main ones. Um, so the initial fourth R program was a grade nine health curriculum. I think you're, you're, you're forward a little bit there on the slides uh, that, that uses um, uh, relationships focused SEL Thanks. approaches. It's very strengths-based uh, and it aligned with health curriculum to be able to integrate the social emotional learning right into health class. Uh, and so uh, that's that's what we started with in, in 2001. Um, it, it addresses violence prevention, sexual growth, healthy sexual growth and behavior and, and problematic substance use all framed within this relationship context. So quick snap of our, our, our scale up, uh, you can leave it on this slide. Um, that you know, since 2001, we've expanded certainly in terms of geography and numbers to more than 5,000 schools and community organizations around Canada and beyond. Um, but beyond the sheer numbers, if you go to the next slide, there's also been a real growth in terms of the types of program nice. approaches that, that come under this fourth R umbrella. So uh, nice. you know, we started with a grade nine health curriculum. We now have grade seven, eight, nine health curriculum in English and French attuned to the Catholic and, um, and non-Catholic school systems that match every province and territory. We've developed some small group versions that uh, are, have a different, slightly different focus and can be used in community organizations. We have some English curriculum, English, and um, and then we also have a, 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 a more culturally attuned set of programs under the umbrella of Uniting Our Nations, where we've worked with Indigenous partners to develop mentoring programs and some curriculum there as well. Um, okay. So, um, Beyond our programs, we also have developed quite a few different training options on, here, go back one, thanks, um, both online and in person over the years. And we've done quite a bit of upstream training uh, with pre-service educators at Western and other places, with the idea being that these are complex social 
um, innovations that we're talking about and that the best time to learn them is perhaps when you're becoming a teacher and to be able to take that into your professional practice from, from the get-go. Uh, if you flip to the next, next slide, uh, I just have a, a really quick snapshot here of the fourth hour as an evidence-based practice. I'm, I'm not gonna go through these findings, obviously. All of these are available on our center website, but I would draw attention to a couple of things. One that you, we see a range of outcomes, uh, including viol reduced violence, dating violence and peer violence, increased well-being, um, and increased scoping skills. And that's very consistent with what Margaret Berry talked about yesterday. The, the promise of, of well-designed and implemented SEL programs is that they hit an array of targets. Uh, we also within these, each of these is like a different study, but we, um, we also have found quite a few moderated impacts where the, the youth who need this programming the most or face the most adversity often have um, the best outcomes. And again, that's very consistent with what, with what Margaret talked about yesterday. So that's just a snapshot of, of kind of our, our scope and type of scale up so that it provides a context for the lessons learned. So to going to the next slide. Our first lesson is to really consider conditions for scale up from, from the start. So back when the fourth R was a little seedling, and, and I'm not sure that looking back, to be honest, we weren't really thinking about it as scaling up, but we were thinking about it as removing barriers. And that meant paying attention to certain design considerations from the outset. So it was quite revolutionary at the time to align our program with curriculum expectations in, in schools. Um, so as to not lose instructional time. And, uh, and now that's, that's quite standard. But back in 2001, it was often that prevention scientists would come in and say, here's our 60 minute lesson plans for you to fit into your school day. So, so that was an important design piece. Things like making each session the length of a class period, which is different for elementary school and secondary school was important. Um, and it's been shown in other research to, to then play a role in implementation quality. Obviously, if you have a 70 minute program and a 55 minute class, something's gonna get lost. Um, and then from the outset, thinking and recognizing that school systems have different levels of decision makers and that they have different information needs or priorities. So decision makers at the board level might be interested in whether or not something's evidence-based and whether it aligns with their board improvement plan. Teachers want the lessons to be very teacher-friendly, to look and feel like the kinds of uh, lesson plans they use. And so we knew ours did because we they were designed by teachers for teachers. So those were all sort of design things at the beginning that really set the stage for scale up. Also reflecting over the last 20 years, I realized that we, um, that we, things like, like design characteristics and, um, and things like uh, end user, that wasn't part of my training as a psychologist or a prevention scientist. So, so reaching out into public health and other, and being a bit more uh, interdisciplinary has been an important move, I think, for scale up. So the next slide, um, second lesson is uh, that scale up is this ongoing process and requires continuous renewal. So scale up, especially sustainable scale up, means uh, you're constantly refreshing materials. So when we started in 2001, cyberbullying wasn't a thing. Um, we uh, the, the curriculum expectations changed, so you have to keep matching those things like. Um, being able to talk about gender identity and consent that get afforded to you by what's in the in the curriculum expectations, being able to use those to the fullest extent. Um, even things like changing from CDs that we gave to smart board files or online files has been important. Relationships change, so the scale up in, in school systems is such a relational process in terms of um, the people at different levels through the system and those people retire, they move. And so how do you keep that uh, so you don't lose sort of that scale up or sustainability because one person changes roles. Uh, we've, we've developed master trainers across the country, which of course increases capacity and decreases cost for having us do all the training. That alignment, ongoing alignment. So beyond matching the curriculum expectations as, as board priorities change, as legislation changes, how do you keep ensuring that that alignment is there and, and that you do the work so the schools can see that without having to think about, okay, does this meet the new curriculum or am I meeting my requirement? Um, uh, something to do with the board. And finally, funding is important that uh, there's ongoing expenses. And, and a lot of our scale-up success has been because we were part of the initial innovation strategy with the three phases funded by Public Health Agency of Canada and, and able to, over a period of you know, eight or nine years, really do this in an intentional and planful way. So getting it out there one th is one thing, but keeping that kind of sustained scale-up is also important. Finally, it's not always linear and it's not indefinite. So sometimes things scale and then they maybe stall for a while in a jurisdiction or, or they move on to something else. And that's, that's obviously 
actually, you know, Mark talked about that as well. Next slide. Just that um, scale up, you know, it the, is, looks different from jurisdiction to jurisdiction because the, the, the contexts are different or the ecosystems are different. Um, and so I was thinking of our, our scale up in Northwest Territories, for example, has looked very different um, than in other places because there was different um, constraints at the outset, the, the, the geographic distances involved, the need to do um, a lot of adaptation work early on and develop new videos and materials. Uh, and so that, that looks very different. Um, and if people are interested, we, are, we have a health economics uh, costing paper that talks about different uh, implementation scenarios in three different jurisdictions that can kind of describe that. But there's not one scale up process, obviously, even you know, within school systems. Finally, last slide, there, there are some um, real tensions here. And one is this idea that you, um, you can Hit, hit, you can go ahead and hit all the points, Anetta, that, um, that that idea of establishing effectiveness before you scale up. So Mark talked about not everything should be scaled. So how, how do you know when the evidence is good enough? Um, and there's a, there's a real pull for programs too. So this idea that we could do an RCT and kind of wait and then start scale up doesn't, doesn't work in school settings because all the things you need for good implementation quality, that joint ownership and co-creation and getting people on board at the beginning, is um, also setting the stage for, for possible scale up. So we have to think about, yeah, what's good enough evidence? What's the it we're scaling? Because things like SAMHSA or CASEL, these organizations that certify evidence want a specific program, but you know, we've just said, and Mark said this too, that good programs and, and continue to innovate and evolve. So what is the, is the it uh, a sort of process? Is it, is it a set of principles that you keep refreshing? And finally, if we start this scaling up before we have the really good evidence, how do we plan for de-implementation? So everybody gets excited, it takes off, it looks good, um, people feel like it works, and then your data show it, it maybe has unanticipated negative effects. We, we need to learn a lot more, I think, about how we de-implement in those cases, because once the train has left the station, it's a, it's a really hard thing to do. So thank you, Barb, and I'll turn it back over to the next panelist. Oh my goodness, wonderful. I mean, you know, it's so, I just want to hear the, the the claps, you know, from everybody that that's online. We obviously uh, won't be hearing that, but brilliant um, presentation. Um, it reminds me of beyond the binder that is part of the school base setting too. I mean, wonderful, Claire. Um, we do now move on to um, uh, Catherine Scharf, and um, uh, Catherine's very interesting Hi. story. Yep, yeah, where you go, Catherine? It's actually, scarf just. Oh, I'm so sorry. That's all right. It invites you to say it that way, but <laughs> the way it's felt. Um, yeah, my, my case uh, today will be, I think, quite different, um, but hopefully helpful uh, in, some, in some way. Um, I'm just going to start by describing the organization, Community Food Centers Canada, which I helped to co-found in 2012. And basically our whole uh, raison d'etre was, was scaling and replication. Um, I'll just read you our mission statement because it's faster. Uh, CFCC provides resources and a proven approach to partner organizations across Canada to create community food centers, CFCs, that bring people together to grow, cook, share, and advocate for good food. We also work with the broader food movement to build greater capacity for impact and to empower communities to work toward a healthy and fair food system. Uh, basically, we were founded to move beyond the traditional charitable approach to meeting basic food needs and to use the power of food to support health and community and to call for broader systemic changes to policies affecting poverty and food insecurity. So as I was thinking about it, and as we were discussing in the, the preamble to the session, there seems to me to be three, three levels of replication, um, and we've engaged in all of them, and it's probably um, important to acknowledge that we received uh, you know, support from Public Health Agency of Canada for all of them as well, which has been incredibly uh, helpful. The, I'm going to be talking mostly at the organizational level today, which was actually funded under the uh, Healthy Weights Innovation Strategy. So similar to the mental health, we have another program under this strategy, the, um, the Mental Health Innovation Strategy. And then as well, we've had special projects funded through the multi-sectoral multi partnerships uh, grant stream. So all very helpful and really lucky that they happen to coincide with our kind of process of scaling. Um, so uh, just to speak to the organizational level, um, you know, it is really about creating um, initiatives or organizations with partners that are complete and discreet um, and somewhat independent, uh, well, independent, tied to a partner organization and called a community food center. Um, 
at the network level, another dissemination or replication level, we have a, a, a network called the Good Food Organizations Network that has 300 partners, uh, grassroots food programs across Canada, sort of a lighter touch approach using principles um, as an organizing kind of uh, guide, offering resources, some grants, training, capacity building. And then the program level, uh, we have like Food Fit. These are more out uh, the Mind Your Food, which is the one under the Mental Health Innovation Strategy and um, Market Greens, which is a kind of a produce prescription and affordable market project. So I, in my analysis, and I'm probably, you know, doing <laughs> Mark's Mark's job and not as well, but I think that there, there are three elements. I mean, I'd already come to this before, uh, to, to all of those approaches. Um, I call them inspiration, information, and implementation. Um, and when I say implementation, I mean funds, training, coaching for implementation. Um, and each of those approaches has a different ratio of those, um, but I'll require at least some of each. Um, at least that's our approach. I didn't use the word innovation, um, which is interesting maybe, uh, and Mark may take me to task for that, but to, to my mind, um, the innovation is sort of a little bit of a mark, can be a bit of a marketing term and sometimes overemphasizes the importance of the newness of an intervention, um, where at least in our case, I think that newness was less important than the double being in the details of, of the how. Um, and uh, moving on to a different point, um, I learned, from other experiences in my past career before this, that often people get inspired to do something, but don't really see exactly what it's going to take to carry out. They might get a manual, i.e. information, but that manual doesn't take into account their local circumstances and sometimes may not even be fully honest about what's required for success because everybody wants to boost their, their program and their intervention. So for example, if you're offering subsidized food, healthy food access, naming the amount of the subsidy so people know what they have to resource can be very important. Um, another sort of thing that I'd seen a lot of that I wanted, we wanted to avoid at CFCC was one-offs, you know, the idea that you can have a whole suite of things that you're doing that add up to a lot of work for you and provide you with a full organizational mandate. But from the, the experience of the people experiencing it, they maybe get like school kids get an afternoon in the garden or it doesn't add up to enough input to really for you to expect to have any change. So uh, I think the eagle eye to implementation is key. Where is the money gonna come from? How do we get some sort of a shared result and sell a sort of unified story, product or brand and get local buy-in while also respecting autonomy and the need to tell their own story? How will we support our partners as real life challenges come up? Uh, what functions can we centralize to capitalize on an economy of scale and prevent the need to constantly reinvent the wheel? And how can we continue to learn from the experience and become knowledge brokers as we go, creating a flow of knowledge to us and back to and between our partners? So uh, having, uh, we built an organization, the origins of CFCC was we built an organization in West Toronto called the Stop Community Food Center, which involved cooking, growing, food, food bank, community meals, advocacy. The question we originally asked ourselves, probably starting in 2010 was, is there any there there or was it just a, was it just uh, organic one neighborhood experience? Um, we quickly realized that if we were thinking of replicating, we weren't going to be able to replicate the whole organization because it, at that point we had 25 staff, two locations, much bigger than you could realistically pull off. We were lucky to receive um, a grant from the Metcalf Foundation that enabled us to take some time to write a paper and explore some of the principles. Uh, at first, it seemed very abstract and, and, and hard to wrangle. Um, and again, innovation didn't really seem to be the key. Um, all of the elements that we had going there existed elsewhere, be it community gardens or kitchens. And it was sort of more the, the, the way that we had executed it and the uh, philosophy and values that led to a more multidimensional approach. Um, so it was sort of the suite of things that were happening um, and, and that took us beyond the tr traditional charitable food model. So we weren't focusing on how much food we could give out, even if it was healthier food, but looking to use food in a deeper way to build health and community. So when we wrote the paper called In Every Community, A Place for Food, um, we looked at the principles and the minimum specifications. And they were things like space with certain elements, a kitchen, garden, dining room, offices, maybe a bake oven or greenhouse, at least five core staff programs in three areas, 
food access, food skills, and civic engagement. And then with early funding, part of which came from PHAC, we started to, no, actually, I don't remember if I, at the moment, I think so. Uh, we started two pilots in Perth and Stratford. And those went well enough that we decided we had the success and momentum to start a new organization built around replication. Um, and it couldn't really grow out of a neighborhood organization, so we started our, a new one. So how would we go about this? Well, we knew it was largely about money. Our sector uh, was plagued by inconsistent project-to-project -project funding, no core funds, volunteer-driven. And somebody had to kind of look this in the, in the eye. Uh, we knew we were pretty good at fundraising. I, this is the Royal We, my um, co-founder and boss and the CEO, Nick Saul, is pretty famous for, uh, for that. So that was a huge, a huge piece that we could bring. And we knew it was a big part of what we were going to have to do. And we didn't shrink from the idea of becoming a core funder. We um, decided to provide $200,000 uh, annually in core funds and raise that money. Uh, although <laughs> reality check over time with our phase two partners, as we call them, we have reduced that funding level to 75,000 um, representing um, a shift towards more eager and aligned partners than we had. Um, and also just, as I said, a reality check about how much we can raise in unrestricted funds. Um, we developed shared services. So uh, obviously the, the fundraising for those core funds, managers uh, that would coach sites, research and evaluation, supports, communications to build a shared brand and, um, and story around what we we're doing, and then fundraising support to help them raise their part of the funds locally, because they also, you know, the budgets for these would range anywhere from 500 to maybe a million dollars. So there was other funds that had to come. Um, I've, I've seen other organizations try to replicate this way without having enough capacity in this way for, this, for the backbone organization, if you will. Um, and, you know, our staff has grown from like four when we started in 2012 to 34 now. So all of that is really going towards, uh, well, not just building the CFCs, but these other parts of our mandate as well, but all of it is kind of this shared service model. Um, so in terms of, I mentioned that we, um, there was this kind of loose program areas that we developed because um, to, again, create enough consistency that you would know where you were when you walked into a community food center and that there would be a there there but that it would be broad enough and loose enough to accommodate local realities. So those areas were food access, food skills, and civic engagement. And um, like that, they, that, that you had programs in these areas was important, but not that they be exactly the same. So, um, you know, a food access program gets people in the door to meet an immediate need, then they can get involved in another program. The other programs might be a dads and kids group or a mom and kids group or a grandmother's um, kids intergenerational garden project. It doesn't really matter too much um, within those broader, broader groups. Um, so that is sort of a, you know easy way to accommodate local innovation and local um, programming. Um, and then you know to codify this and to try to like make some consistency we develop shared strategic objectives, you know, flowing into our lovely logic models that could then help uh, to create a framework for all of these, um, these initiatives and then to develop the shared metrics that we needed as well. And those metrics we developed were high enough level that they could, um, could capture the broad impacts. You know, I'll just give a few examples like, is, is this community food center an important source of healthy food for you? Do you feel part of a community here? Have you made a friend, a friend that you can call on? Have you volunteered, become more involved in issues? Like these are things that could be shared across these very specific programs, regardless of what the, the immediate content was. So, or the, the finer grain content. So a big part of what we do is an annual program survey where we talk to, you know, five to 600 people across the country uh, at each center. And uh, we're now at uh, 13 community food centers. We'll have 20 within the next year or so. I'll just try and quickly, I realize I'm, I'm pretty much out of time. Um, some of the lessons have been probably sort of apparent um, throughout, but I'll just name them and maybe there'll be a chance to come back. Um, fidelity versus flexibility, it's a very hard call when you're not running things. You don't know the local context. People will always say, you don't know the local context. Sometimes you do, sometimes you don't. You sometimes don't, you don't know which hills to die on. Um, 
the money's too big a stick to use. You know, you make a lot of investment in people. They decide they want to, for example, do police checks, which was a great example that Mark used in his presentation, exactly one that we went through. We tried to convince a partner not to do it. They refused. What do you do about it? In the end, they came around of their own accord, um, and we didn't have to, to you know, use any big sticks. But um, nonetheless, it was a bit of a problem for our philosophy. This led us, uh, these types of issues led us to develop operating standards, which are far from scientific, but do help to create minimum expectations right from the beginning for people and to create an opportunity to have a conversation. There's minimum standards and then there's optimal standards. Some of them are quite difficult to define, like what is a welcoming and respectful space? Like you decide, I decide, who knows? But at least we can have a conversation where we say, hey guys, you need a paint job. This looks like there's creeping wall stains and mold here. Um, and then finally, just that we've learned over time how important it is to find the right partners to begin with. Um, you know, at first we were more going begging for, for partners. We hadn't proven our brand or our value. There wasn't trust there. Um, and over time, I think we have gotten the ability to have people more come to us, see our expectations, know that it's a lot more than just money and, um, and that it's going to take a lot from them too. And then they need to be um, aligned and they need to be ambitious and they need to want to do it anyway. Uh, so that has been helpful. And um, I think I'll just end there uh, because I have gone a long time. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. That's wonderful. I do want to say as we load up the, um, or Mariette, as you get ready and, and come on, I do want to say that um, just a reminder for everybody, there will be a recording, but also in response to some of your feedback from yesterday, we will actually, particularly for those presentations that um, do not have um, slides, which was is, is totally fine, the hub as part of its follow-up will actually extract some main messages that will be part of the um, proceedings. So you can, you can expect that as well. So Mariette, over to you. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, and I do have slides, so oh, perfect, that was, that was very quick. Everyone can see them, I hope. Can someone just say yes? <laughs> yes. Okay, good, good. <laughs> it's happened to me before that. Uh... All right, so my name is uh, Mariette Chartier, Mariette Chartier. I'm a senior research scientist at the Manitoba Center for Health Policy at the University of Manitoba. Uh, I'm talking to you from uh, sunny uh, but cold Winnipeg, uh, located uh, on Treaty 1 territory and home of the Métis Nation. Uh, it's, it's really a pleasure to be able to talk with uh, all of you today. I'm going to put my timer on because I realized as I um, was practicing for this, I went way over time. Uh, it's, uh, it is a hard thing to do because it, uh, you know, it's five years of um, developmental evaluation. But the name of our project is uh, Towards Flourishing and it's uh, mental health promotion for children and families. And I want to share with you today uh, some lessons learned from, uh, from this project. And um, when we applied for this project, uh, it was a partnership between you know, the university uh, and uh, a government office uh, within the government of Manitoba and a regional, um, a regional health authorities. Uh, so I'm talking on behalf of all that team. So you can change slides now, please. Uh, so some of this background is that uh, I, I guess I, I'm gonna be talking about something that happened five years ago. Um, it is still ongoing towards flourishing, uh, but my most involvement was during that five-year project between 2010, 2015, where we uh, were funded by the Public Health Agency of Canada through their innovation strategy. Our goal was to promote good mental health in families in the postpartum period. And I think a key to our success was the, were the partnerships that I just uh, talked about, but also uh, that it was actually embedded within the provincial public health system and, and uh, the, the home visiting, the provincial home visiting program. It had that look and feel of the system um, because it was developed within the system. Uh, you know, when I, 
not really left, I'm still in touch, but not as involved. But at, um, at that point, all public health nurses and home visitors had been trained. Uh, the majority of families with multiple parenting challenges had received screening, the materials, the consultation, uh, but also all families, uh, it was available to all families and, and that we weren't able to track, uh, but it was through the public health system. So because all the nurses had the training and all uh, families get at least one postpartum visit, uh, you know, we're hopeful that, uh, that uh, those who, who could who, who need it could, um, could have access. Uh, we were thrilled in, at the end of the innovation uh, project that uh, the Manitoba government continued to fund uh, the positions within the uh, Towards Flourishing as part of, the, of their child and youth mental health strategy. And I'll try to talk today a little bit about how I think that might've happened. So if you could <clears throat> please go to the next slide. Uh, it, it, so what is this towards flourishing strategy? Uh, you know, this is the model that was developed. I'd say two years down the road, it changed a lot, but this is uh, what it looked like two years in. Um, in the middle, mental health and promotion uh, or mental health and well-being of the families. And then if you look, uh, I don't have access. Oh, I do have access to, I think I have access. No, I don't have access to the cursor. The mental health promotion role, which is in the upper corner, uh, yeah, there, thank you, uh, was, as Margaret Berry talked a lot about this, you really need uh, boots on the ground to, to do this work. And so we um, hired actually six mental health promotion uh, facilitators throughout Manitoba. Uh, we started smaller, uh, but at the end, that's what uh, we had. They were responsible for uh, ensuring all this happened. So if we go counterclockwise, uh, there's everyday strategies uh, for mental well-being and education for families. So uh, the families, what they would get is mental health literacy, uh, dispelling, you know, some of the, the, the stigma and um, it really promote the, the idea that this is a positive thing that you're doing for your health and um, teaching them the everyday strategies. So they're kernels, they're evidence-based and they're things like, you know, physical activity, um, social supports, mindfulness. We had nine uh, strategies that, uh, that the families would actually get to do. Now, we realized very quickly that you can't do any of this work without a, a a public or a, you know a workforce. So the mental health promotion facilitators, if you keep going down uh, this wheel, uh, would do the training for public health staff uh, the, and home visitors. The public health staff <clears throat> quickly told us that uh, they felt unsafe doing this work unless we had some kind of screening for severe mental health um, issues and an access and collaboration process. Uh, this was embedded within cultural lens. We have uh, indigenous newcomers and francophone populations and embedded within a developmental uh, research and evaluation framework uh, that evaluated process and the effectiveness of the strategy. Next slide, please. So, uh, you know, um, Mark talked a lot about context and this is something that uh, I, I think can't be stressed enough uh, that when you're developing uh, something, if you don't pay attention to context, it, it just will not work. Uh, I found that in um, other work that I'm doing now. Uh, so Manitoba, our context is a, a population of 1.3 million. Doesn't sound too much compared to Ontario, but it's just such a huge province with um, you know, different, different contexts. So uh, most of our population uh, 55 to 60 percent is, you know, around or in Winnipeg, so very urban. But the vast majority of the territory is urban and uh, rural and 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 remote uh, northern. Uh, we have a large uh, population that is Indigenous, uh, you know, First Nations, Métis, Inuit, and uh, we're officially bilingual, and we have a large newcomer population. So uh, these were all things that throughout the five years that where we worked at developing this intervention, we, we consulted, had focus groups, meetings, full day workshops. Um, and so uh, all this was really necessary to, 
to, for instance, uh, the, the picture at the bottom there is our, our uh, full day workshop within uh, Thunderbird House with Indigenous uh, service providers who gave us fantastic feedback on our materials. We overhauled everything because of that and it made a much better product. So let me just uh, go on to the next slide uh, and I guess get a little bit more to what we really need to talk about. And those were the challenges. And I guess when we started this work, the biggest challenge uh, that we needed to overcome in Manitoba <clears throat> was just that mental health promotion was not well understood. That the mental health sector in Manitoba itself was uh, quite, um, is limited, still is. And, um, but the, the public health nurses and home visitors had had told us that they really felt that we needed to address this. So they were open to this. At the same time, they were really afraid of it. Um, they were afraid of opening a can of worms. They were afraid that we would not be able to address the mental health issues as they came up. And then the public health uh, sector who we were partnering with for this intervention really was afraid that we would be opening the floodgates. As it is, they felt that uh, they had limited uh, mental health services and didn't know what we would do, uh, they would do with um, more referrals. So th those were some of the, the big challenges. And the way we, I guess, worked with people is really, you know, it's education. As I mentioned, we, we had Margaret, Mar uh, we had all kinds of workshops. Margaret Berry came, Corey Keys. Uh, we had numerous meetings. We got to know all the different levels of, uh, of government because we did have uh, a government partner. Um, we did focus groups with parents, with um, the home visitors, with the public health staff, with newcomers, with francophones, with um, the indigenous groups. And all of that uh, helped uh, come up with our, our strategy. So I guess it's, it's a lot what Mark is saying is uh, that attention to all the different contexts. Uh, I guess a, a, an additional challenge would be that uh, since to, so that it was a success and we were very happy in 2015 when the funding for the development and evaluation of this uh, and implementation of this um, of mental health intervention was funded. Uh, when you, you stopped this developmental process, things continue to shift and um, there, there isn't that energy that there was during that five year uh, period. You do need those resources to continue to, uh, to do that work. Uh, I, I continue to do it to some extent, but um, it, it's, I, it, I see that as a challenge. Uh, that um, I, I'm hoping that um, this this will continue because we did hear that it was making a big difference for for families. I'll just um, say one a few last things, maybe keys to our success, and then I'll I'll, I'll end on that. Uh, I think some of the keys were that we responded to a, a perceived need. We developed within partnerships, intersectoral, multi levels. We embedded uh, within an existing uh, system and made things look and feel like the system. We used that developmental um, um, uh, evaluation uh, by Michael uh, Patton. Uh, the, the skill uh, building in the existing workforce was key and needs to be continued. And we, we did an economic analysis at some point, uh, and I think that was part of the clincher to, uh, to finally get accepted and uh, you know, continue and sustain the, the program. But um, I, I could continue, but I will, uh, I will stop there. Thank you so much for your attention. Oh my gosh. Thank you, Mariette. It is, I, I've, I mean, I think all of us fully appreciate the, um, um, the challenge in you know, sort of punctuating, highlighting um, uh, what you're scaling up, plus some of the lessons. So thank you for doing that uh, succinctly in the time. So uh, we will move on to the uh, fourth um, uh, panelist, and this is our duo. We've got uh, Carla and Taylor uh, from the First Nations Health Authority from BC. Welcome. Thank you. Um and thanks, Ryan, for, for advancing our slides for us. Adit Denizet, Zakaizet, Skaizet, Saikarlatet, Sydney, Witset, Lakhediset, Yitsehu Abitasiste, Yitsehu Kaswakhediset, Adawanaran, Anishnabe, Kadanishoni, Tabi Honestite, 
no hienta, the does deal, no theodactic. Hello, leaders and future leaders. My name is Dr. Carla Tate. I'm Wet'suwet'en calling in from my home community in Witset on unceded Wet'suwet'en territory. I belong to the Dark House Clan of, or sorry, the Dark House of the Big Frog Clan, and I extend my deep gratitude to the traditional territory holders for allowing us to meet on your land. My training is in clinical psychology, and I'm honored to draw on my educational and cultural background to serve First Nations communities here in the Northern region of BC as the mental wellness manager with FNHA. And I'll turn it over to Taylor. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Taylor Bainticosa. I'm Dene, um, and I come from the Fort Nelson First Nation on my mom's side and the Prophet River First Nation on my dad's side. Both of my communities are located here in Northeastern British Columbia in Treaty 8 territory. Um, my parents' traditional territories overlap. Uh, so um, the only place I think I could ever call home is in this part of Turtle Island. Um, it's a pleasure to be here with everyone this morning. I am a founding member of the Life Promotion for All My Relations Youth Advisory Committee. Um, and that is what we'll be talking about this morning. And yeah, back to you, Carla. As Taylor mentioned, we're here to talk about life promotion for all my relations youth advisory committee, which we call LPAMR, uh, which is a group of 15 Indigenous youth and one elder who have all who all have lived experience with being affected by suicide in some way and are thriving in the face of mental health hurdles. Together in 2018, we embarked on a journey to discover what exactly life promotion means to us and how our skills and knowledge can be used to support each other and our peers throughout the province while affecting systems change and contributing to FNHA's vision of healthy, self-determining and vibrant BC First Nations children, families and communities. To do so, we engage in team building, skills training and cultural practices to grow as individuals and as a team while working on projects that support Indigenous youth's mental health along the way. One of the ways in which uh, the operation of LPAMR can be illustrated is through telling the story of how we went about finding shared languages and concepts. A goal shared by the KDE Hub and the Mental Health Promotion Innovation Fund to better define what life promotion means for Indigenous youth. To do so, we brought LPAMR members together and held discussions about how they defined life promotion for Indigenous youth. We found that life promotion means different things for many of our members, including Brandon, who defines it as living in the present and focusing on the now. Megan, who characterizes it as reconnecting to culture to have identity and purpose. And Michelle, who says it's giving youth the opportunity to break the stigma of mental health and encouraging help-seeking behavior. So we're providing a platform and channeling LPMR members' voices and opinions into the very foundation of the group, into how we actually define the concept of life promotion. This experiential and collective learning experience has also recorded and is also recorded and shared with other Indigenous youth through mixed media format. So what we are learning as a group can be learned by the wider Indigenous youth population. And while defining life promotion may have been our goal then, LPMR operates as a bit of a microcosm of a learning health system where we strive to be in a state of continuous improvement. We watch for our opportunities to affect change, note emergent problems, brainstorm new solutions and draw strength, knowledge and resources from FNHA to make this process possible. Then ultimately we move our brainstorming into actionable health promotion initiatives. Um, to provide perhaps a more current example of the work that um, LPMR has done and how we operate, um, back in November, we released our youth COVID-19 wellness campaign uh, with the support of FNHA. So evidence was suggesting that the younger population of Canada was transmitting um, COVID-19 um, more um, and that their mental health was being particularly affected. So as a group, we identified this problem and worked towards co-creating a solution um, in partnership with FNHA. So drawing on our collective definition of life promotion, it actually ended up being a strengths-based campaign that honored the, the di diversity of voices uh, within our group. 
and we wanted to provide um, support on healthy ways how to manage um, mental health and wellness during COVID-19. So you can see that um, there was five members that took part and each of us um, really spoke to um, a component of wellness that, that we um, do in our own lives. And so we, um, yeah, each uh, have, we each have um, a website on the FNHA youth um, website and we talk specifically to those. Um, Thank you, Ryan, for changing the slide. Um, another role that LPAM, LPAMR has is, um, is to advise FNHA. And one way we do that is by providing um, input on how we think um, knowledge and information can be effectively shared with youth across the province. And one way that we thought um, we could achieve that is by creating these bitmojis, and this is mine. Um, so each member that, that was part of the campaign um, was built a bit, Bitmoji. Um, and we just thought it was a fun way to, to get youth engaged. And to date, um, since November, our campaign has had um, roughly 1.5 million views online. Uh, so that's something we're really proud of and is actually pretty incredible for, um, for being our first campaign um, as, a, as a committee. and. Uh, it was really fun to be a part of. So before this presentation, we reached out to our members to define what LPAMR is. And one member, Megan Metz, who you might have seen on the previous slide, mentioned that we each use our own unique passions as driving forces to create positive change in our respective communities. And we can see that clearly in this campaign. This is synonymous with FNHA's policy on mental health and wellness, wherein it stated, that we are enhancing the conditions for mental health and wellness by focusing on First Nations children and youth, building tailored approaches with them to foster resilience and ensure that they are able to thrive. A marker that indicates the group is going in a good direction. Another indicator of success was the amazing professional um, and personal development of the LPAMR members. So naturally we wanted to keep a good thing going. As we seek to improve LPMR and honor our policy of building tailored approaches for life promotion among Indigenous youth, we know that this committee's operation needs to be closer to home. And thus we're moving towards a hub and spoke model. Our central LPMR committee will continue to operate and will build out resource and knowledge sharing networks with other regionally based LPMR committees that are currently being founded in a number of FNHA's health regions here in BC. So in the North, we've heard many times from our communities that regionalization or ensuring that the decision makers and roles supporting the region are based here at home um, in the region this, they serve, um, that that's just a, a really key piece to ensuring those services are relevant and responsive as some of our other speakers have uh, mentioned previously. Um, it's also important that they draw on the unique cultural strengths and acknowledge possible barriers or resource differences to, to those specific regions and communities. So uh, standing up a Northern Youth Advisory Committee and supporting a youth coordinator role will allow us here in the North to uphold FMHA's organizational value of community-driven and nation-based health promotion and work with youth leading the way. We hope to emulate Northern style, the good work that the Central Group has done um, hosting localized culture camps, trainings, and knowledge exchange opportunities like those pictured here. We're excited to move towards this new chapter in LPMR's operations and acknowledge that it was made possible through BC government funding to continue the work of our central committee while funding from the Ministry of Mental Health and Addictions has allowed us to scale LPMR's operations up and out to our regions and bring the youth advisory groups closer to home. So while we're at a new and exciting chapter in LPAMR, we have had our share of challenges in sustaining and scaling up the work. The resources required to scale and sustain effective youth life promotion are substantial undertakings. 
our healthcare system and the existing funding streams presently don't offer enough support. And um, I guess a prime example, our, our, our person manning the slides here, Ryan, has been um, the, the sole person supporting this work up to this point, along with the amazing youth committee um, he supports. So resource sufficiently, we can draw on the skills and the voices of youth and translate them into positive change. It's vital that our healthcare system prioritizes youth life promotion and wellness in addition to dedicated funding streams. It's so much more effective, we see, to empower youth with the resources and tools for wellness through their own voice than wait until they're struggling and expect them to reach out for mental health in intervention. And we know this is particularly true for First Nations youth. So some key areas to improve moving forward are ensuring a dedicated and continuous funding stream, of course, to support youth mental health and life promotion. And uh, just that acknowledgement that although grants provide opportunities to pilot work, they can be limited and they require significant effort to obtain. Um, and combining different grants as we did here, changes reporting and evaluation requirements, uh, which is more time demanded. Um, and also limits the long-term planning capacity. And finally, we're lacking organizational human resources capacity dedicated to youth wellness, both here at FNHA and among our, our external stakeholder partners. Uh, I know that we are running short on time. Uh, we were gonna show a We Matter video done by um, my fellow committee member, Megan Metz. Uh, but as part of our committee, I think, all the, uh, as much as we see the importance um, of the various ways that we can measure and justify scaling, we know that um, that better justification um, can be done when youth are able to tell their stories of healing. Sorry, my dog. Um, and sorry. Um, there, are yeah. some there are some requests to see the video. If you're open to it, we are very happy to have you share the video. Perfect. Thank you, Taylor. Uh, hi, my name is Megan Metz. I come from the Heisler Nation. My traditional name is Gunduk. And actually, it wasn't even a full year ago that I was away at school. And um, my grandfather was diagnosed with a terminal illness. And that hit me really hard. And to be so far away from home, <laughs> it I didn't know what to do. And I was all by myself. And I just started to isolate myself. And I couldn't find a reason to get out of bed in the morning. I just felt so alone. I didn't have any friends. I hadn't made any friends away at school. So I just started to feel like a failure. I started to feel like a disappointment. I started missing classes. And it wasn't until someone came and knocked on my door and they said like, hey, I haven't seen you in like two weeks. Are you OK? And that's what made me realize, holy, I just withdrew myself from everything and everyone too much. Like, maybe I should talk to someone about this. And it was really hard at first. It was really hard to talk about it. It was really hard to deal with. But as long as you have a good support system, it's you can get through absolutely anything. Like. I thought, sorry. <sighs> I thought that that was going to be my life forever. That's exactly what it felt like. I know it sounds so ridiculous, but it seriously felt like the way I was feeling was going to be forever. But it hasn't even been a full year. And this year is already so much better. <laughs> It's already so much better. <laughs> and I'm so excited. I have so much to look forward to. I have so much traveling that I'm gonna do. And I'm actually going back to school. And yeah, I guess 
the point that I'm trying to get across is <laughs> it gets better. <laughs> and and you matter. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Ryan shared the link for our FNHA youth landing page, which has other amazing videos and contributions by the LPAMR committee. And I believe he will be trying to share the Youth COVID Wellness Campaign Toolkit as well, which is a, a PDF document. Uh, we'll get that out to the organizers. Thank you. Thank you so much to uh, both of you and and to all panelists. Those are those are moving, touching, informative stories. There's no question about that. And uh, um, what we'll do, and I really do appreciate the um, um, willingness of everybody on the line just to extend our time in plenary just by a, a few more minutes here. Um, with respect to the video, um, you know, the theme of the con of the symposium is context, and I think viewing that video in context of the um, uh, presentation from Taylor and from Carla was important to honor, and with the um, permission of even a few um, comments in the chat. So uh, thanks to everybody for for your willingness, and and um, I'm glad we. I'm glad we um, offered that up. So what we'll do, the plan was to have um, Mark as the bookend to, to this. He provided that pre-recorded presentation. Just, I can imagine his mind will be percolating like crazy. I know that. Um, and uh, for him just to perhaps circle back to um, some of the key points from the presentation that he offered up and uh, just a few reflections drawing from the lived experiences that we've heard and returning to some of those points in the presentation as little teasers uh, before we move into um, these small groups. So Mark, I'll, I'll turn things over to you. Great, thanks Barb. Can you hear me all right? All good. Great, thanks. Apologies for arriving a couple of minutes late. What my Wi-Fi wasn't cooperating, and I have many skills, but fixing my Wi-Fi is not one of them. But I'm here. Uh, listen, terrific. I, I really appreciated all those presentations. They were diverse. They were coherent. They were engaging. And so, kudos for trying to get across a lot of important information fairly quickly. Uh, Barb asked me to be brief, <clears throat> so I'm going to just say four things that I thought were affirmed in some of the, the stuff laid out in that original video, um, where that original video was my own attempts to make sense of it for myself, uh, based on the literature and the, the work of a lot of other Canadians. So it's not my work necessarily. Four things that were affirmed, four things that were elaborated on that I thought are important for us to know, and three things that I think uh, popped up for me that I think I'm thinking about a lot more. And uh, you know, I suspect that as a field, uh, we're already doing this, but we could think about it a little bit more and maybe try and, and uh, get even more coherent about it. So here are the four things. Number one, uh, it's very clear that the it's that people are talking about vary all the way from principles to, uh, to, to models to some version of principles plus min specs. Catherine actually used that language. I, uh, I think that's important. And we're trying to find out often what the heck our it is. What is the it? What is the essence of our of the thing that we're trying to scale. I thought that was affirmed, the variation in that. I think the six dimensions of scaling, everyone had, uh, part of their experience could be at least somewhat understood through the lens of uh, scaling deep. How do we capture hearts and minds of people? How do we deal, Mariette, with the, the fact that some people are not ready to talk about mental health in the same way, or Catherine was talking about you know, inspiring people. So all those six dimensions somehow got touched on in greater or lesser degrees in each of the case studies. We for sure, uh, everyone talked about the importance of context, jurisdictions, rural, urban, uh, north, um, uh, different demographic groups, uh, resource levels, context matters a lot. C plus M equals O. C plus our intervention equals outcomes. So that's really, really important. And I think we really, 
the presentations reinforce the, the fact that scaling is unavoidably, whether we want it to be true or not, is an adaptive, emergent, ever-evolving process. Adapting to context for sure, but you mentioned adapting to COVID, uh, adapting to shifts in new expectations of the intervention that we want to scale. So there's nothing, this is not a good space for control freaks. Like it, this is not a good place for plan the work, work the plan. Right, uh, we, it's a chess game. We have opening moves and then we're constantly adapting. So I think that was all reinforced. So I felt like the thoughts in, from all these other Canadians that were summarized in that presentation are directionally correct. And they add some coherency to the work that you're doing. Here's some things that you elaborated on that I thought were really important. Number one, uh, to Claire's point, and Claire had mentioned this earlier, I really thought this was important. Who and what context one does the scaling matter? So if you're scaling in a big system, the scaling machinery is actually, the impetus is already built in. If you're working for the Department of Ed or something like that, you're already working on a scale. You already have to think about context and diverse contexts. Uh, and uh, you, you have different levels of just, it affects what is considered justifiable and not. If on the other hand, you're working more grassroots and you have an, a, a thing that you want to scale into the mainstream that doesn't already begin in a big system, it's a lot more taxing, right? How do you prove that it's working? The bar goes up, uh, your relationships, your authority. So who is doing the scaling? I think really matters. And, and as Claire was speaking, I just kept thinking, oh, what does that mean for this group? Uh, what does that mean for that project? So who scale matters, number one. Number two, Catherine raised some things that I thought are not evident enough when we think about this, but the unavoidable uh, tensions that get involved in scaling and tensions that are not easily resolved, they are managed, right? Uh, you know, the tension between good process and good product, the tension between short-term outcomes and long-term outcomes, the tension between crazy diversity and everyone wanna be unique, but needing for some level of commonality. And the one, Catherine, that you had mentioned was the tension between, yeah, fidelity and flexibility, right? So how well, those aren't going away. So part of managing scaling is management and using creatively these tensions, right? And avoiding the urge for false trade-offs. It can only be fidelity or it can only be flexibility. Well, no, it's some kind of magic spot in between there. So Catherine's stuff really uh, surfaced that for me. Mariette, you, you, when you were speaking, I didn't know, like, I would maybe like to chat later. I wondered if there was also the possibility that when we're scaling, uh, there are natural limits to how much we could scale. And I wasn't, you didn't say anything to suggest that there was, but I went, well, what if some of the stuff that gets hatched here, these ideas doesn't play out in the interlake region? Like there is really, you'd say, well, we can, I'm making these numbers up. We can scale uh, in the South, region 80% of the sites, but in Interlake, maybe it's 30%. So I thought maybe there's a natural limit. The readiness isn't there, the arts, hearts and minds aren't there. It's just, it's not gonna work. So I, it, your, your story raised a question for me and I know Manitoba a little bit. And uh, Carla and Taylor, the one that struck out for me is just a confirmation that uh, your, the work that you're doing seems to be more of a, a, a principle driven innovation. Uh, and the uh, how one develops and scales a set of principles is very different than a program or an approach like collective impact or a model in, in the way that Catherine was talking about. Catherine, I know you have principles with the model, but the what being scaled actually makes a difference. I actually think the pathway to scaling would vary dramatically. I can imagine a good idea could catch fire in a way that maybe a more traditional program couldn't. So it might have different pathways and dynamics. So those are four things from each of them that I thought were unique in what was revealed. And here are the three things that I'm left with that I'm curious about that I would think, oh boy, I hope I could have more confidence to say something about this in a year from now. Uh, number one is the importance of the institution who is that it, or institutions that are driving and coordinating the scaling effort. Like Catherine, this popped up for me as well as Claire immediately and for the rest of you, well, it takes a lot of expertise and resources to be relational, to keep adapting curriculum, to reach out and build networks. So what is the credibility needed? And then the six dimensions of scaling that I mentioned, again, summarized from Canadian authors, the machine, the social machinery, maybe that's not a good word, that is a critical factor. Who's gonna drive and coordinate all this? 
that takes a particular that is it's more than infrastructure infrastructure is out there who's going to even go start nudging and pushing and agitating with the infrastructure so that i think we have to think about the the mechanism for driving the scaling process number two uh i think there's something interesting about experimenting at scale there seems to be a, a an overlap between people going Catherine, you even were kind of cautious about using the word innovation. Like part of it is here's an idea. We don't even know if it completely works. We're experimental, but the pressure to scale is already there. And so we're experimenting at scale. And that is a slightly different dynamic than scaling something which we pretty well are confident that we know what it can do. So I'm not sure about what to do with that, but I think it's important because I think half the time that's how it happens. And the last thing, the third thing that I'm thinking about, uh, and Carla and Taylor, you you ended with it. I think that it would we will feel more confident in some of this work if we better understand what we mean by justification. And Carla and Taylor, you were saying, when justifying something, please keep the 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 voice of experience in mind. And I agree with that. I think that that needs to be something. But I think we're really unclear about what when do we know something should be scaled. And I use that Dyson vacuum cleaner, like we're not gonna forget that example, are we? It's so kind of goofy. We're not doing Dyson vacuum cleaners. But the idea of when do we know it's good enough to scale or on what basis do we scale? It might simply be, we don't know if it's perfect, but there's a need for it. And we're even willing to accept clumsy results. I'm not saying any of your results are clumsy, but I think it'd be nice to be a little bit more confident about that. So I think this is an area in which it's worth trying to reduce the fuzziness. Barb, I hope I, I did that. So four affirmations, four, uh, four elaborations, and three additions. Fantastic. Fantastic. And I'm th thank you so much, Mark. And I again, I appreciate everybody's flexibility. And I think that, I mean, it's, it's like, Mark, you were here yesterday about, you know, noting the tensions. That's just, it really came up yesterday and, and many others um, within that pandemic uh, context session. A little bit of game planning right now. I first of all do want to uh, just say thank you once again, a very sincere thanks to um, all speakers, panelists who were part of the session, um, this first session today. Excellent experiences and reflections uh, from all of you, thank you. And, and the sharing of experiences um, and questions that other people have is um, the whole focus of the small group discussion. So I'm going to offer up sort of, here's a bit of a game plan for how we go forward just with the, um, um, just with the sort of the, the time before the next session. So, well, and before doing that, I also wanna say, here's a little bit of good news on, on timing is that, you know, from a hub perspective, this annual symposium, as I mentioned on the opening session, there are some features of this annual symposium that are unique. This is not a one-off event within the, you know, or on the topic of child youth mental health promotion and for the Mental Health Promotion Innovation Fund. It is one sort of support throughout an annual cycle of supports. And so I mentioned that because um, it means that we can actually pick up on some of these themes and conversations throughout uh, the next year and beyond. And in particular, the next session that actually starts in another 45 minutes, that actually is another, that is a very first and timely opportunity to be helping to shape what the priorities are over the next year. So just to help you know, sort of ease any sense of, oh, we can't get all of this in within our conversation today. That's okay. There, there will be opportunities to um, continue those conversations. So game planning, we've got 45 minutes um, to the next session. What we are going to do, we will sort into um, the, uh, into the small groups and you know, obviously those of you on the line, you will choose whether to accept that invitation that pops up on your screen or not. Um, and what we may do, depending on the numbers in each group, we may uh, merge the groups, just, you know, some of them that, you know, we have then a healthy um, numbers, uh, numbers for a small group discussion. So I think we just give it a whirl and, and see where things go. And uh, then we, and, 
you know, everyone knows that in another 45 minutes, we will be reconvening. And I do encourage um, everybody to take a short break, at least before we come back for, for the next session. But you can decide that in your small groups. We're not returning to plenary on this one. So um, I hope that feels sort of uh, at least um, some type of loose structure, but then also enough fluidity that you can decide where to from here. So with that, um, once again, thank you. And um, I think Eric, that's over to you then for um, orchestrating the, the small group invitations. No problem. Uh, I will launch the breakout rooms. Um, and I just wanted to reiterate that if anybody wishes to take part in the French uh, breakout room discussion, please feel free to mention it in chat. In chat. Uh, donc si vous aimeriez uh, participer à cette discussion en français, Merci de l'indiquer uh, dans le chat. And I will, you will receive your prompt in just a second here. <laughs> 